Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with me, Mr. Terry, as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today we are heading back to the awesome Salmonella Academy, and we got another video from him, and it is titled The Banana Republics. So I'm excited to get into this and to see what he kind of is going to do with it. Now, historically speaking, a banana republic often refers to a nation that has been economically dependent on exporting usually a fairly rare kind of commodity um, in uh, earlier times bananas were one of those it was kind of seen as an exotic product that again only grew in certain areas and again one of these nations or regions that has that is totally economically dependent on the export of that which can cause a lot of problems people can try to exploit you plus you're kind of putting everything into one thing uh, economically, which means that if that thing becomes not a commodity, that it can really make things difficult for a country. So I'm interested to see what he does with that, if, if, if that even is the direction he's taking with. That's just the historical context. But we'll check this out. I'll see if I can add anything, and I'll let you know what I think. And we'll go ahead and get started here in a second. Now, the original video is down below. Make sure that you go down there, okay? Do it now. Uh, that would be great. And uh, so you can get the view, like, subscription over to Salmonella. Even if you're sub to him, definitely give him the view time and the support that way so these awesome channels can continue to do the awesome things that they do here. And if you haven't subbed to my channel, love to have you around. Thanks for liking and subbing. Let's go ahead and get started. The Banana Republics. <laughs> Hey kids, do you like fashionable, high-quality apparel at an affordable price? Well, too bad, because that's not what we're talking about today. I'm going to learn you I'll a like little the thing or two brand. about the real Is that still around, Banana Republic? Republic? Our story begins during the turn of the 20th century in Central and South America. Agriculture's kind of a big deal right now. You've got a ton of little plantations all over the place growing bananas, sugar, pineapples, that kind of thing. And they're doing all right for themselves, no big deal. But then, refrigerator... Yeah, I don't think good things about this region of, of the Americas. Uh, economically speaking and agriculturally speaking is that climate can be similar to things um, in like tropical regions of Africa or Southeast Asia because they're on a similar line of latitude and have similar climate you can grow things over there uh, that you couldn't grow more north of um, of that region and like the northern hemisphere for the most part so that makes those uh, regions agriculture very important it's also a reason why they became home to generations and centuries of slave labor to grow these types of products duration happened and it changed everything because now produce could be kept fresh for way longer in transit meaning the fruit companies could suddenly open up their business to the international market mm -hmm. their biggest new trade partner being the united states this massive mm -hmm. opportunity gave rise to three main companies known as the united fruit company that's a big one. fruit company and the vaccaro bros i don't know like the last growing, shipping and selling fruit i know that united fruit company i mean they're they're like the reason why you get imperial efforts by like the United States who like give this enormous company and a huge asset to the economy of the United States. And if they have an interest in some other region, you know, places like America can find themselves trying to like militarily intervene there, overthrow governments to protect the economic interests. It's that kind of men, um, blending of capitalism, but also like the governments and making money and combining those into like imperialism in a way. Three firms made just obscene amounts of money, a lot of which went towards buying out smaller family-owned farms and plantations. This allowed them to make even obscener amounts of money, until eventually the only competition that remained was each other. And then shit got real. The year is 1910. One of the companies I mentioned, Coyamel, was doing most of its business in the country of Honduras, when the president of Honduras, Miguel Davila, decided to give a land grant to the Vaccaro Bros in exchange for helping to build some roadways. In doing so, they okay. basically stole a bunch of Coyamel's potential plantations and gave them to a competitor. So Samuel Zamuri, owner of Coyamel, said to himself, Dang, I hate those guys. If only there was some way for a guy like me to significantly influence the world around him for his own personal gain. Wait a minute. So he used a portion of his <laughs> McDuck-esque fortune Wait, I'm to rich. hire a mercenary army, which he gave to one of his friends, former Honduran President Manuel Bonilla. Power of the purse here, man. You can go ahead and finance your own armies if you want to. Can you imagine that today if you had corporations? Walmart all of a sudden had an army to, to be able to protect their economic interests or something like that. Powerful times, huh? And together, they overthrew the entire fucking government of Honduras. <laughs> yeah. Should have called a Cuyamel. <laughs> anyway, Bonilla took power and gave very generous concessions to Cuyamel and United as thanks. But then America saw this, and they were like, hey, that's not very freedom of you, young man. To which Zemery replied, it's okay, we're gonna help this country succeed. After all, politics and business are essentially the same thing. 
Well, I suppose it's not our place to be uh -oh. policing the governments of other nations yet. Still, though, maybe... Oh, also, also... Nanners. All right, I'm sold. Do what you want. <laughs> so with their interests secured, the businesses Pay continue yeah. to thrive and expand. This is what American imperialism, in a way, American influence imperialism looked like. So the United States had uh, this, this, this policy where they may, mostly were just going to focus on the Americas. It's going to be a sphere of influence, right? Monroe Doctrine. And... A lot of it looked like this. There's lots of different types of imperialism, economic imperialism, where it's focused on um, not necessarily spreading culture or something like that, but for economic interests, for trade partners. And this is kind of that taste of American imperialism that happened right around the turn of the century, around the, around the era of Teddy Roosevelt. But since they got cut so many breaks by the government, very little of their commerce actually ended up benefiting Honduras as a whole. In fact, the national debt of Honduras got so bad that the government ended up not being able to perform a lot of its functions. So in response, the three fruit companies stepped in and yeah. said, no worries, took, took we got over. this, and decided to basically build the nation's infrastructure for them, including roads, railways, shipping lines, telegraphs, telephone lines, radio towers. They even switched the whole country off to the U.S. dollar. Keep so you're basically seeing companies step in and do the things that governments traditionally do, like infrastructure, public works. You don't see uh, companies necessarily step in to do that. But of course, what you're gonna, you, you know, you'd probably see is they want influence in the government, though. Not they're just paying this stuff for nothing. They're gonna want something in return, right? Keep in mind, this wasn't out of the goodness of their hearts. It was mostly just to make their own businesses function more efficiently. But it go. was helpful either way. Anyway, help now, you, help not me, only did they have back, total power over their plantations, but also a monopoly over nearly every major industry in the country. Many other Central American nations soon followed this pattern, creating a corrupt sort of symbiosis whereby the fruit companies get huge tax breaks and land grants yeah. in exchange for a modernized infrastructure and payoffs to the rich minority. And so, the Banana Republics were born. Born. Sounds like a pretty sweet gig, right? And it was. For the upper 5% of the populations mm. who happen to hold some direct share in the plantations or shipping lines. Yeah, for so you're saying, host I mean, the only benefit you're getting is, all right, you have a new road and stuff, but maybe the economy isn't growing very much. And maybe there's not, it's not trickling down in the effect of higher wages or more jobs or something like that. That that seems to be the, the fear that they're that they're having Say, there. though, life mostly consisted of working on land that wasn't even theirs in exchange for dirt poor wages. <laughs> So that's how things were for like a decade and a half. At some point, Coyamel was bought out by United, but then Zamore became the owner of the whole thing, somehow, and the Vicaro Company was renamed as Standard Fruit. Then one day, in 1944, the country of Guatemala had a democratic revolution, and the newly elected leader, Juan José Arevalo, wasn't happy with how the companies treated his people. So he implemented several reforms, like a minimum wage law and universal suffrage. And while the populace got a lot of benefit out of this, United Fruit most certainly did not. Because more rights for their workers means less profits for yep. the business as a whole. Yep. Then Guatemala got a new president. If, I mean, if you're a company that essentially rules the country, which is basically what they're doing, like Honduras and stuff like that, you you can have influence over yeah labor laws, right? You want to keep for your for your I guess to benefit your company wages low and maybe certain. Just, I guess, worker rights stuff. Stuff that you saw here in the 1900s where you saw um, labor strikes and push, um, get for more labor reform and stuff like that. You wouldn't have maybe as much of that motivation if your country was ruled by a company specifically, right? And I, it seems like that's that's what's happening in, in, um, in these countries. And one of the things that... Uh, seems to be negative about some of these banana republics. Jacobo Arbenz, and he continued these reforms, and United continued to get the metaphorical shaft until finally, in 1953, they decided to go to the USA for help. Oh, Eisenhower. Yo, what's up? This Jacobo guy, he's he's making us pay minimum wages. Well, that doesn't sound very good for business. That's not all, though. He's also taking our unused land and giving it back to the people. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> oh, dear. You don't think. By the way it's looking, Dwight, I'd say he's a dirty... Oh, God. Collectivizing? No. Don't say it. Kami. Kami! Kami! Yeah, go get him, Dwight. Whee! He did it! He said it!
Holy shit, you actually did it. World star! <laughs> and from that point onward, Guatemala was ruled by a series of U.S.-backed dictators. Okay, you have to, have, you have to see hat hair the rest of the video. This kind of situation happened in several other places and times as well, almost always driven by some combination of red fear and yellow love. I won't give any more details for the sake of time, but that doesn't mean they weren't big deals. So you might be wondering, where did these companies go? Surely the clan of banana shenanigans can't still be around today. Well, that's where you're wrong. They're still in operation, just under different names. Standard Fruit changed their name in 1991 to become none other than Dole Food Company. Oh, you know, Dole! When I was a kid, I used to play a we lot all of Super Dole. Monkey Ball, and I used to oh, wonder that's a good game. what kind of cruel tyrant would just... Sub to my gaming channel, it's Terry Gaming. More gaming stuff. Stick an ape in a ball for their own amusement. Well, now I know. Those <laughs> if you bastards. Want. As for United, one day in 1976, their CEO decided he couldn't take the heat anymore, so he jumped out the fucking window. That's a real thing, look it up. Then some other guy bought the company and renamed it to, drumroll please, Another big Chiquita one. Banana. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The face that you lady. once knew as an innocent, fun-loving dancer-slash-fruit merchant is actually a ruthless tyrant who overthrows democracies and undermines basic her specifically. rights for her own profit. <laughs> anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, <laughs> and thank you for watching. That was super informative, actually. That was... I, I didn't know some of the depth of some of the um, specific deals that were made for these Banana Republics, but it was really good to see what what actually happened um, with these companies literally took control of these these nations right um, but you saw what what I mean it what it seemed to, to give was um, social issues right um, big inequalities in in probably um, uh, well in wages but income gap being huge rich and the poor are very big and maybe it's not as much protection of workers' rights and stuff like that, or, or maybe none at all. And you see that, but you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how can you get involved? Well, I remember when they're talking about the '50s here, you're talking about the Cold War, right? You want the United States to intervene on any side? All you got to do is say that there's a threat of communism, and people lose their minds, which uh, it's part of the Red Scare um, of the 1950s, where you just said that C word there, communism, and stuff happens <laughs> you can you can like things happen there look at mccarthyism if you've learned about that um, but that's more of a topic for another time but interesting to see this era of like imperialism in a way or if you even want to call that corporate imperialism um either way but see that and then see how that blended into the cold war because all of a sudden if you started seeing things like hey we need more equal wages and more equal earnings and and uh, more protection for workers' rights. All of a sudden, people started thinking, oh man, that sounds like elements of communism. And that was such a bad word in the 1950s. Um, but you see how those discussions turn into Cold War conflicts in a way. And this was a big thing because anything you had like that, people started talking about socialism, communism, because you're talking about uh, trying to make equality economically amongst people and stuff like that. And that was going on all over the world. It was in Latin America, it was in Africa, and it was in Asia. Um, so you're seeing how that ties in together. So I think that was really cool to see that. And I think that's something I can take away when I kind of bridge this, this era of imperialism and then decolonization, which happens after the world wars. And you can see how those changes affected these types of countries um, and the whole political rhetoric of the time. So that was really good. That was, that, I really, I, I think, took a lot out of that. But I loved how he just, like, um, Eisenhower is losing his mind and stuff like that. That was great. So as you can see, with now I, now I have no hat. All right. Well, with that, guys, um, that's going to wrap it up for us. The original video is down below. If you didn't do it yet, go ahead and click that. Make sure we get the support over to Sam there. And, um, yeah, links to other stuff down below. Join our Discord community. Um, other links to other kinds of fun stuff down there, too. So, all right, with that, we will uh, see you guys all later. Bye.